you think about the last five to 20,000 years have been main, mainly focused on the masculine and uh, that that's been the primary impetus in our culture and in cultures around the world. That's the, been the conscious um, culture that uh, the opposite pole, of course, would be the unconscious and that's the, the feminine. And so my image of the, the dark goddess or the dark feminine is the archetypal feminine, the, the, um, the, the unconscious within all of us. And since uh, in our culture the feminine has been so wounded, um, probably in every culture, but it just feels like in the Western culture has had such a push that um, the dark feminine is, uh, is really uh, teaching us, uh, both women and men, about being, about holding the emptiness. So uh, in your question, what's the main message to us at this time, it's really to learn how to heal the deep wound of the feminine within ourselves, um, within all women and within the culture. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I guess the dark goddess that I relate to the most is the Erish Kegel uh, from, from the myth of the, uh, the descent of Inanna. And I just finished doing a workshop with women in um, Abiquiu and I always take people through the descent, going through the seven gates to the underworld. Inanna was the goddess, the Sumerian goddess of the upper world, and really the goddess that embodied the um, embodied civilization. And um, her sister, Erish Kegel's uh, consort, uh, had died, and so she wanted to pay tribute to her sister. So she had to go to the underworld, and really that's what a woman does when she makes her descent, when she when it's time for her to meet the dark feminine. So she went through the seven gates and at each gate she had to meet a gatekeeper. And she would approach the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper would say, you know, what is it that you are doing? And she said, well, I go to meet my dark sister, Inanna, uh, Erish Kegel. And so um, the gatekeeper checked with Erish Kegel and he said, well, she has to come down just like everyone else, meaning she had to come naked. She had to, at each, at each of the seven gates, she had to release her crown and her necklace and her royal cloak and her undergarments and her skirt and her royal shoes and go down through the seven gates. And what one does psychologically is release all of their roles in the outer world and all of their attachments to their roles, you know, whether it's mother, daughter, sister, wife, um, filmmaker, psychologist, writer, whatever it is, um, and find what's really within oneself. So she gets down there, she goes through the seven gates, and she, um, Erish Kegel is waiting for her. And Erish Kegel stares at her with the eye of death, and she kills her. And she hangs her on a peg to rot for three days. And I think that that's the most important learning to me about the dark feminine. Because as you hang on the peg to rot, um, you're empty. And it's only in that emptiness that we can begin to really reconnect with our instinctual natures which have been lost to us for so many centuries. So I like the image of hanging on the peg to rot. I like the image of emptiness. Um, so uh, to, to answer that question, what's the main message to us at this time, it's, I think it's to learn about that uh, sense of emptiness, which is learning about being. Um, learning about being a vessel. If you think about um, the African tribes, the, the women are the vessel makers, and um, if you think about a woman as a vessel containing all that she needs um, and birthing herself out of that. So it's, it's learning about that. It's not something we're taught. You know, it's not something that uh, we're taught in school or that's affirmed in the culture. Um, someone who's 
going through a descent or, or coming in contact with the dark feminine, they don't usually talk about it a whole lot. Um, women are starting to talk much more about their dreams and meeting the dark feminine in their dream. Dreams, I, I hear that all the time as a therapist. People coming in and saying, I had this amazing dream about this big black woman who held me in her arms, and what's that all about? Or um, dancing with a dark woman, or merging with a dark woman. So um, the, the dark feminine is definitely coming up from the unconscious in women's dreams, and in women's art, and women's poetry, um, and in men's too, but I hear it more from women. And of course, I'm, I guess I'm much more interested in women's imagery right now and much more interested in women's words because to me, that's what sources me. Um, those are the words that have been lost for tens of thousands of years. So that's what I want to hear. This was a, a client who had uh, kidney surgery in her mid-40s. And um, she talked a lot about meeting the dark dream woman and the healing of her feminine wound. Uh, and she, she says, I realize that I'm descending into hell. I put on my red parka. I want to return to the earth world. I'm surrounded by skeletons and ghouls. My skin is eaten off my body by gnashing teeth. That's very much the image of the descent, the, what I just talked about in terms of Erish Kegel going down into the underworld. I'm bones walking among bones. The wind begins to blow and I become very dry. I'm on a desert, my bones dry and crumbling into a pile of dust. A drop of clear water drops into a little pile of bone dust that is me. A dark woman, an African or an Indian woman, stirs the dust with her fingers to make a pasty mud. She begins to remake me. She starts with my vagina. My human body begins to cry. She's making me a woman first. As my body is completed, I see that it's the same body that I have now. My scar from surgery is still there. My breasts still sag from nursing. It's the body that I get for this world. I'm not dead yet. I'm alive in this body and in this world. A transformed body is for another place. The, the image that's so powerful is this dark dream woman remakes her. She stirs the dust of her bones with her finger, and then she starts to recreate her, um, starting with her vagina first. So she honors the feminine first. I think that um, a lot of women have dreams about merging. When I said merging, really making love with the dark feminine, you know, recontacting their vagina, recontacting their genital parts, and and honoring the place of being woman. Um, this dream is really significant because you think about um, the, the stories that we've heard about Yahweh that uh, he made uh, um, first man and first woman out of dust. Well, the ancient Sumerian stories tell us that it was um, the ancient goddess figures that were the first creators. And this woman who had this dream is dreaming that again. You know, she's dreaming something that has been lost to us maybe five or seven thousand years ago of the dark dream woman stirring the dust and making the, um, the human form. And in the remaking of the human form, she heals herself. Um, so in terms of the, the dark feminine in dreams, um, I hear about uh, dark women on subways, I hear about them on buses, I uh, hear about them in the kitchen, um, I hear about them dancing. Uh, it, they're not in a particular place, but they usually have a very direct message. Um, I talk in the heroine's journey about uh, the dark dream woman that came to me who was a uh, aging black woman who was very thin, and she was sitting in my kitchen and she was just rolling her hands over a bunch of lemons, and uh, she looked at me and she said, I've been traveling all over the world, girl, and I found my words, and now it's time for you to find yours. And uh, it was just a, you know, it got my attention, really got my attention. You know, when you have a dream figure talk to you directly, really want your attention. 
then um, you know that it's a, <clears throat> a part of the unconscious that you have to pay attention to. Um, so <clears throat> the dark dream woman is the archetypal feminine. And um, what does that mean? That means that um, <clears throat> we have to find out what it means. It's, it's, the, it's the juicy, it's the moist, it's our um, instincts, it's our intuition. It's really learning to listen to the intuition and following that, almost like looking into a crystal ball. <clears throat> it's honoring the body. I think um, your question, why is it coming up through dance, is because women are reclaiming their bodies. And um, most of our really juicy knowledge comes from body wisdom. It doesn't come from our heads. And um, so the dreams come to us from the dream world and come from the body. Um, I think that dancers really are the ones who are bringing forth a lot of the very, very rich imagery right now because it's, it's coming up through their, the base of their spine and through their guts and out their breasts and out their hands and through their powerful legs. and <clears throat> They're using goddess movements. I think that people um, don't realize how hard it is to remove the patriarchal mind. Um, we were talking before about the need to please and the need for approval. I mean, we all grow up uh, wanting approval from both our mothers and fathers, and um, our whole life is predicated basically on, on pleasing the patriarchy. So when we make a choice about not going in that direction, um, we don't have another, we don't know about another form. So there's a lot of grief. There's an enormous amount of grief when one decides not to, to follow patriarchal mind anymore. Um, we don't know what is there as a safety net. And uh, so the work that I do with women, uh, what I usually do is see women, they come into therapy when they're beginning a descent, when they have made a decision in their life, well, I'm not going to go for the next promotion, or, you know, I've been very successful in my career, but I feel very empty inside. I feel worn out. I feel worn down. And so there's something missing, um, like the story of this woman who was um, stripped raw and dry as bones. Most people start to feel that, that dryness, that sense of spiritual aridity. So um, it's at that point when they grieve, you know, they grieve the loss of self that they've never known. Um, so moving into the dark feminine is a, is a sacred journey. And a lot of people aren't really willing to take it because of the unknown aspect. And also because of the, um, the tension of, uh, of holding the tension of not knowing which way they're going to go. I mean, we're a culture that wants very quick answers. Uh, we have a candy store mentality where, okay, if, if this doesn't work, well, then I'll try that. If that doesn't work, well, then I'll try that. And this is really about being still and being and listening to self. The first step in the heroine's journey is the separation from the feminine. And that can occur for a young girl as early as three or five uh, when she starts to really discard what her feminine nature is. And a lot of that is because she identifies more with her father, uh, particularly if her mother, um, as mothers were, the mothers of my generation often were really devalued by the culture because they didn't work. And so they were at home and they were frustrated. And um, the feminine started to be associated with being powerless or being manipulative or being angry. Um, and so a lot of little girls didn't want to identify with that. They wanted to identify with the strong aspect of the culture, which was the masculine. So the second step of the heroine's journey is really the identification with the masculine. But what happens in that early separation from the feminine is that women separate from their own body wisdom. They separate from their own dreams, their intuitions, their poetry, their early dance. I mean, they separate from the juice of being feminine. So they identify with the masculine in terms of goddesses. You know, if you think about the, um, the stories of Athena, whether this was true or not, the whole story about her being born from her father's head, 
and that her mother was denied. Metis was denied. That was her mother. And of course, the story is is that uh, Zeus, her father, uh, had heard that um, his progeny were going to be much more powerful than he. So he swallowed Metis, his consort, his wife, so that she could not give birth. And um, then he gave birth to Athena out of the top of his head. So, I mean, that's the archetype that we think of when we think about a father's daughter, is um, being associated certainly with the head, being associated certainly with the father, Zeus, being associated with power, being associated with civilization, and denying her mother completely. Because Athena, in the stories, denied her mother Metis completely. Now, I teach a class at UCLA called Creating Personal Myth, The Heroine's Journey, and the women in my class are rewriting that myth so that Metis has some, um, some uh, credit. Um, but certainly Athena would be associated with that part of the heroic journey because that part of the heroic journey is very much like the masculine journey. You know, it's gathering all the degrees that you need, um, mounting your steed, having your spear and going into to battle. And that is really the first part of the heroine's journey. It's ego development. So the next part after the separation from the feminine, the identification with the masculine is the road of trials. And that's when you're doing the work in the outer world to achieve whatever your goal is, whether it's to be a filmmaker, a psychologist, a writer, a mother, um, a dancer, going through all of the hoops that you need to do that. And um, uh, the next stage is really the um, reaching the illusory boon of success. And, you know, if you think about that in terms of the heroic journey, it's going in search of the Holy Grail, or slaying the dragon, or finding the maiden, whatever it is your goal has been. And so the, our heroine finds her boon of success. Perhaps it's not exactly what she thought it was going to be. Maybe it doesn't give her the satisfaction that she, saw, she thought it would. And women are not very good, really, at um, deeply owning satisfaction. You know, we reach a certain goal, and then I think women have a very hard time taking credit for what it is that they do, um, particularly if it's something that they do naturally. So then it's, okay, well, what's the next goal? And um, so we go from goal to goal to goal, you know, mountain to mountain to mountain. And uh, then uh, really move into a stage which I've called um, the spiritual death, where a woman begins to realize, I've done all of the things I was supposed to do in the outer world, and it hasn't given me satisfaction, and I'm at a point where things have to shift. And that's really when you start to move into the descent. Um, if you think about um, Demeter and um, Psyche, um, Demeter is a goddess of the descent. Um, Inanna and Ereshkigal are goddesses of the descent. Kali is a goddess of the descent. But what happened with Demeter and Persephone, um, and of course this is the way the story has been told, and I know it's being reframed by, by women, but uh, the story is that Persephone was playing in the fields uh, with two of her friends who were motherless daughters, um, Aphrodite and um, I can't remember whether it was Athena, but anyway, these were other motherless daughters. And the, she saw a particular narcissus that attracted her attention. She went to it and picked it, and of course the earth opened up and Hades came forth and abducted her and brought her into the underworld. Well, um, Demeter didn't see this happening, but Hecate, who is the third aspect of the goddess, um, Persephone is the maiden form, Demeter is the mother form, and Hecate is the crone, or the wise woman. Hecate heard her cries um, as Persephone made her descent, but she didn't see anything. And this is oftentimes what happens for a, a woman in the descent. She can hear her own pain, but she doesn't see what has happened. You know, she, she doesn't have the perception on it yet. So Demeter um, starts to search all over for 
Persephone. And Hecate says, you know, I did hear her cries. Let's go to Helios, the sun god, and ask for his help. So they go to his help, to Helios, and he says, you know, I can't help you. And so they go to the wrong place. They go to the father gods. Um, just like uh, in the story of Inanna, when she made her descent, she told her trusted uh, maiden servant, um, Ninshubur, she said, you know, if I don't return, go to the father gods and ask for their help. Well, she also went to the father gods, and that was not where the help came from. So what Demeter does is she wanders through the countryside for, let's say, nine months. And while she does that, nothing grows. And when a woman is in her descent, um, she nothing grows. I mean, she is dry. She is arid. She's void. Um, and uh, people started to really notice that the crops weren't uh, forthcoming. So she ended up at the well of uh, Eleusis. And she was there crying, weeping for her lost daughter. And uh, the, uh, I guess it was the siblings of the, or the uh, children of the local king saw her there and said, you know, what is it? Can we help you? And she said, well, I would really just like to take care of a child. So they brought her home and she started to take care of the child of this king and queen of Eleusis. And um, each night she would put the son, I think it's Demophone, into the fire to keep him immortal. And one evening the mother saw this and she came in and she said, you know, you, she just screamed in, in fright that this woman who she knew nothing about was um, frying her son. <laughs> And so uh, she said to the woman, you know, you've now destroyed this. Uh, he will no longer be immortal. But at that point, um, she was really brought to her senses. And um, I guess it's also at that point that Zeus, that the people went to Zeus and said, look, you, you really have to do something here. And so he spoke to his brother Hades and said, Persephone needs to return. And Persephone made her return. Um, while she had been in the underworld, she had not eaten of anything. But as she made her return, she ate one pomegranate seed that Hades gave to her. And when she made her return, Demeter ran to her and said, have you eaten anything in the underworld? And she said, well, I just had one pomegranate seed. And she said, well, that's enough that you will have to return. And so, what happens in that whole um, story is that Persephone is no longer a daughter. She's moved from a daughter psychology now to her own woman psychology. She returns to, to the mother for part of the year and then she makes her return to the underworld for part of the year. And that's really our journey. Our journey is about the descent and the ascent. And that in making the descent and then returning, we are no longer daughter. We're no longer daughter of the patriarchy, and we're no longer our mother's daughter. We are ourself. You know, we have become whole in the descent. That is also what happened to Inanna when she made the descent and met her dark sister Ereshkigal. When she returns, she's no longer um, identified with the patriarchy. She has known the deep feminine. and. So anyway, that's the, the stage of the descent in the heroine's journey. Uh, the next stage is called the urgent yearning to reconnect with the feminine. When, when one has made a descent, one has, is completely changed, completely changed. And what used to work uh, before the descent doesn't work anymore. So women really want to find out what the feminine is about. It's a time when women start to come together in women's groups. They start to do rituals. They start to pay much more attention to their own menstrual cycles. They pay much more attention to the cycles of the moon. They, uh, they want to dig in the earth. The earth becomes very, very important in making that connection with Mother Earth, with dark dirt, with dark clay. The thing about the heroine archetype is that she's transformed in the heroine's journey. And she starts out very much um, like the, the hero. Um, it's very much a solo quest, and it's very much leading with the mind. 
but after she goes through the descent, she's changed completely. And the last part of the journey is really a co-created journey. It's with other women and with other men and with children and with nature. It's not the ego. It's not the journey for the ego. It's really the journey for the self. Um, so after the uh, healing the mother-daughter split is a um, healing the unrelated masculine. And what I mean by that is that each one of us um, you know, has both masculine and feminine natures. Uh, masculine and feminine don't refer to gender, they really refer to, to qualities. And in, since our culture is so masculine defined, each one of us carries a wounded masculine. And for me, what that might be is my perfectionist nature or my driver nature or the part of me that denies my feelings, um, what I call egregious denial. Um, greedy part, um, the part that doesn't let me rest, the part that's very demanding, the schedule-oriented, goal-oriented part. And a little bit of that is fine. I mean, I need to have goals and I need to have schedules to get my work done, particularly as a writer. You have deadlines, so you have to meet those deadlines. But there's, um, for me anyway, because I'm definitely a father's daughter, a person who, a woman who grew up very much identified with the masculine, um, it puts me out of balance. So the stage in the heroine's journey called healing the wounded masculine or the unrelated masculine is f identifying those aspects within myself instead of projecting them onto the men in my life, instead of projecting them onto my son or my father or my husband and saying those are aspects of me and I have to heal those. So to give you an example, my wounded masculine likes to write for 12 hours a day without stopping. Well, that's not very good for my body. You know, that hurts my back. It um, hurts my psyche. I can't sleep very well. So it's, I have to schedule breaks because the way that I work, I wouldn't get up and take a break. So, I mean, I have to actually consciously work with, with that part of me that's the driver that's unrelenting. In terms of the, uh, the grail myth, um, if you think about uh, Parsifal looking for the, the grail, that really was about healing the unrelated masculine. The, um, the Fisher King was wounded, was wounded, we don't know whether he was wounded in the genitals or wounded in his leg, but he was so wounded that there was, almost like with the story of um, Demeter, uh, all life had come to a standstill. And Parsifal uh, went in search of the, the grail, but he forgot to ask the wounded fisher king what ails they. This was, this was what he finally had to learn. And that's what we have to ask ourselves, you know, what ails they? And what ails the culture is the, the loss of the feminine. So we can't heal the wounded masculine in our culture until we recognize the feminine. And that is why the dark feminine is so important right now. That's, that's why she's making herself so known, because uh, we can't continue on the path that we are environmentally, economically, culturally, um, we'll destroy ourselves. So, okay, so that's the healing of the wounded masculine. And then the last stage of the heroine's journey is really the sacred marriage of the masculine and feminine, taking everything that the heroine has learned throughout her quest and bringing them into balance so that she's, you know, she's not more masculine and more feminine. I mean, we, we are at different times in our life. And the heroine's journey is uh, a cyclic journey. It's not something that we take once. It's something that we go through many, many times in our lives. And we can also be at different stages on the circle at once. Um, uh, I'm aware right now, since I'm, I'm working with another book and I'm really needing to pull, uh, pull on a lot of my masculine energy, that I'm working on um, the identification with the masculine, but I'm also trying to heal the unrelated masculine. So I'm at two places in the journey. Um, and I am from day to day at different places. 
I didn't mention in the descent. The descent is um, is a sacred journey that really needs uh, to be honored for as long as the time that it takes. Um, it's a timeless journey. You know, it has no morning, has no afternoon, has no evening. It's a dark journey, and um, it isn't limited by weeks or months or even years. So it's. I think that it's something that women have to honor as just part of their journey, and they're not going to be in a descent forever, but to honor it while they're in it. Um, just like um, Demeter had to grieve and go through the countryside, and then she became kind of a nursemaid. She just she did the the simple things of life. She did the divine, ordinary things of life. That's what we do during a descent. We do soul work, you know, whether it's scrubbing the floor, washing vegetables, that's soul work. And it's just a matter of bringing it into consciousness and not saying, oh, there's something wrong with me, you know, I'm not succeeding out in the world. It's, it's, um, it's a time when we're relating to ourselves, and that's, that's the most success, success we can ask for. Well, actually, the image that came to me wasn't the water. It was the, the healing aspect that came was, um, uh, was Saradwin, the, uh, the Celtic goddess, with her, uh, with her cauldron of inspiration. But, um, well, I, the healing aspect of the goddess, I also think about um, in the Native American tradition, Wind Woman, who knows about the magic and the sacred herbs. Um, but the, the water and the chalice and the vessel and the feminine, um, if you think about the chalice as being the container of all things, our healing is within us. Um, and the image that comes to me in, in healing is, uh, oh, I was working with a man who was dying of AIDS and uh, he kept saying, you know, I'm so dry, I'm so dry. Um, what he needed, he really needed to be bathed in water, just held in water and rocked to, to make his transition. The descent is about death. I mean, it's about death of our identification with our ego. Um, we cannot know the fullness of ourselves until we die to our ego identification. You know, if I see myself as just a therapist, or I see myself as just a writer, or I see myself as just a mother, I'm very limited. You know, I'm many, many, many more people, and I have access to many other realms. But if I stay in just the realm of the mind, or even just the realm of the heart, I'm very, very limited. So, um, so the death we have to give ourselves over to to death to to find who we really are um, we're very very tiny in comparison to who we could truly be if we surrendered to that type of death and transformation people are really afraid of the idea of transformation and death because they think about it as an enormous loss, but they don't think about it as enormous gain, which it is. Um, but the gain is the unknown. So moving into death, we move into mystery. Um, and that's what the archetypal feminine is all about, is the, the mystery. And we can't explain that with words. Um, we can't explain it even with pictures. Well, some people do. But uh, it's moving into the unknown and, and trusting, you know, moving into the unknown with grace and trusting that what we need will be there. I guess maybe that's getting back to the image of the chalice or the vessel, that we have everything we need within us. We are connected with the universe. Everything is there. Everything is there. It's just a matter of tapping into it and trusting that it will be there and also not pushing the timing. You know, it's not ours to control. Just like death isn't ours to control. One dies when one dies. We're not a, we're not a culture that teaches patience, so it's, it's hard to allow ourselves to, to live into the not knowing, to hold the tension of not knowing, and to wait for all the puzzle pieces 
to fall in place so that the picture becomes clear. And it does eventually. It just takes time and um, allowing. The feminine is really about the yielding and allowing and allowing the pieces to come in their own time instead of controlling everything. You know, when we control things, it doesn't work. A lot of us know that we're not alone, but we don't dialogue with spirit every day. Um, that's what's necessary. I mean, where I dialogue with spirit is out at the sea, because that's very important to me. Um, when you asked me before about water, um, for me, the, the goddess is the sea. And I think the reason that is for me is because I like to lie um, on the, the wave right before it crashes. Um, I mean, on the other side of the wave. And just to be held in that rocking motion. And just to totally let myself go into the float. And to trust that I will be rocked by Mother Sea. And it's a, it's a, I guess it's a dance that we do together. Because if I move over too far, then I'm going to hit a wave. And um, so I have to just kind of find the balance where she can hold me and where I can stay afloat. And close my eyes and put my, my arms behind my head and just trust. And so I do that often. I mean, it's probably one of my greatest disciplines and teachers about trust. Um, and how long I can keep my eyes closed and how long I can keep my body in a float and how long I can trust that I'll be held by the mother. That has been part of my own healing of the mother-daughter split is finding healing in nature. I think that's true for a lot of people, not only women, but for men too, that their greatest healing of spirit comes in nature. You know, whether it's at sea or whether it's in canyons. It's why I photograph um, canyons like uh, the photograph behind me, I, I spend a lot of time in the desert out in Joshua Tree. Those big boulders look like the body of the goddess to me. We've got big thighs and big breasts and a big vulva and she's there. She's right there in the landscape. Rituals co-created and um, it's not us going into a church where a priest is standing there and saying all of the words and we listen or we space out. Um, the rituals that I'm involved in with women are always co-created. Um, there has to be an intention. You have an invitation to a ritual. And why are you doing a ritual? The rituals that I do when I do workshops on the heroine's journey are the ritual to heal the mother-daughter split. So the first is the invitation. We come together and um, everyone has a part. Everyone is a participant. Um, everyone has either something to say or something to do or some intention to um, be made. There's a connection with spirit. We call in the Great Spirit and the Great Mother. And we call in the four directions. So there's an acknowledgement of the spirits above and below and the spirits of the four directions and of all of the kingdoms. The animal kingdom and the mineral kingdom and the plant kingdom and the human kingdom. So it's really acknowledging that we're part of an entire universe. We're not just uh, egotistical humans. Um, I think the importance of ritual right now for women is that is the honoring of the cycles of the moon. Uh, many women get together at the full moon and um, create rituals together. Um, many women are doing menstrual rituals, whether it's to honor a young girl's moving into the time of her menses or um, women. I just did a ritual on, on Friday for a woman turning 50 and that was to honor her moving into um, the time of her menopause and uh, the time of her wisdom years, the time of her croning. Um, the important thing is the co-creation uh, and the important thing is women honoring women. Um, and listening to women's words, women's songs, women's images. So what's the importance of ritual? It's calling in spirit and it's dialoguing with spirit and it's creating a form in which to do that. Um, and people do it of course singularly too, you know, whether in meditation or in their own prayer circle, but there's a, an enormous power that comes in, in co-created rituals with 
women and with women and men because of the intentionality. Everyone has the, ins the same intention and everyone's participating. A lot of people don't get ritual right away because they don't realize that ritual works on you for days and weeks and months later and the real meaning of the ritual might not come to you until you have a dream about it or until you're walking down the street and all of a sudden it comes to you. So again Ritual doesn't have a particular timing, you know, it's timeless. And the holograph has been created, but when you see it, it is in your own timing. Between Maria Gambudis' work and Merlin Stone's work, uh, these two women have uncovered uh, the goddess for us at this time uh, in a way that's just cracked open everyone's consciousness. Uh, Maria's early work was on the Bronze Age and then her work um, in her es excavations, I mean she's the one who has done all of the work on uh, or the seminal work uh, that allows us to understand how the Kurgan invasions were the ones that destroyed the matristic cultures where men and women were equal and where the goddess was the deity that was worshipped in every home. Um, she wasn't just in a temple, she was worshipped in every home. And from what we understand from Maria's work, it was an egalitarian society. You know, um, both genders interrelated in such a way that neither was dominant. I think that's the fear of the patriarchal culture is that, well, if the goddess returns, then it's going to be a matriarchal culture. And that's not what the historians are saying and the archaeologists are saying. They're saying that this was a matristic culture so that the um, it was the mother line, but it wasn't dominated by the matriarchy. It was an egalitarian society. Um, in terms of uh, patrilineal descent, um, I think women lost their um, power when men learned that it was their particular sperm that inseminated a woman. And that then they decided, well, this is my possession. This woman is my possession. This child is my possession. And before that, woman was so mysterious because she was the only one who could give birth. But as soon as man realized that she had this power and he didn't, then he wanted that power for himself. Um, and that is the, the whole denigration of the feminine is just being property. You know, you're my woman, you'll give birth, you'll have, you know, so many children and we won't keep those girl children, we'll kill them. So, I mean, that's changing uh, dramatically. But the thing that has to happen, and it's not happening very quickly, but young girls really have to start honoring their bodies. And we have to, as women, um, give young girls the sense that their sexuality is sacred and that their ability to give birth is sacred and that their body is a temple of the goddess and that they have to honor it as such. Um, I work a lot with adolescents and all of them are always complaining that their bodies aren't right, their breasts aren't right, their stomachs aren't right, their legs aren't right, and they don't honor themselves as vessel. So, and neither does our, our culture. Our culture, um, if you think about advertising, um, you know, there's a particular woman that's the type that everyone aspires to. Well, a woman comes in all different size and shapes. And just imagine what it would have been like to live at a time when the woman's body was honored and was sacred in all of her different forms. Whether it was the wonderful Venus of Willendorf, you know, big and juicy, or um, some of the, the thinner goddesses, but every single woman's body was honored and sacred. That's what I hope that we can get back to. I think the feminine face of God, I mean, you know, we can say now from Maria's work that um, she would probably say, you know, six and a half or seven thousand years ago that it, that it disappeared with the Kurgan invasions. What happened to the feminine face of God was that when 
the patriarchal nomadic tribes came in and destroyed matristic cultures, the goddess went underground because she was no longer honored. They brought in their male nomadic warring gods, the, the gods of power over, the, the gods of domination. And so they destroyed the feminine face of God, which was the, the god or the goddess of balance and of harmony. They weren't interested in balance and harmony. They were interested in possessing lands and in making people their slaves. So those people were not ready for the Kurgan invasions. They, they, didn't, they weren't warring people, so they really had no way to defend against it. And, um, you know, the, the Kurgan invasions destroyed the feminine face of God. She went into hiding and now she's out again. <laughs> she's definitely out. I mean, I think she's been out for probably the last, well, during this century, you know, since the beginning of the 20th century, but, but it's only now, or in the last 30 years, that people can see her and honor her and have shrines in their own home and talk about her without people laughing. <laughs> you know, the, the goddess is, um, she's very much alive and well in the culture. I had, I had a workshop in uh, Omega, two summers ago, which is in New York, the Omega, um, it's a growth center, and there was a woman uh, who was a stockbroker, and she has, in her office, she has her goddess shrine. <laughs> I mean, and I figured, if the goddess is on the stock market, she's everywhere now. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> the wonderful thing about Celtic Christianity was that um, it was tribal, and uh, there were both women and men who were preachers and who went out into throughout the world to, to preach. Um, Celtic Christianity was very much a, a creation-oriented Christianity, uh, which, which honored five kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the human kingdom, and the, um, the angel kingdom. So if you think about the Celtic knots, you know, you see how they're interwoven, or even the, the, the triple spiral, it's interwoven. Um, so it's a non-hierarchical uh, Christianity. Uh, it's an interconnected Christianity, or what the Buddhists called interbeing, that one part was not more important than another. So the, the human kingdom was, didn't have precedence over the plant kingdom. Um, or a precedence over the mineral kingdom, that there was an interconnection. Um, the other thing about that I really love about Celtic Christianity is that it honored the feminine. Um, women were priests and women were preachers. There were the Shilinagigs, the image of the goddess um, with her beautiful labia displayed, and that used to be on the, the temples and even the early monasteries. Um, uh, and they were part of Celtic Christianity. And I was on Iona, uh, which was a center of Celtic Christianity in Scotland. And on one of the monasteries, which actually probably became a nunnery, her labia had been worn off. So that you, you I mean, that has happened throughout the Celtic world, that the Shilinagig, the, the, the goddess of fertility, um, has been defaced because the priest came along and said that, you know, sexuality was dirty instead of seeing that as the mother, um, the, the birth goddess and the death goddess, you know, that she gives birth to us and then she takes us back into the earth, into her womb. So Celtic Christianity, um, in terms of the cross, you know, you have the cross and then you have the circle. Um, and the circle is the symbol of wholeness, of completion. Uh, and it's also the symbol of the feminine. So it's really the connection of the masculine and the feminine. Very different than the Roman Christianity where we have the image of a dying man, Christ, on a cross, which is the image of suffering um, and redemption of our sins. Celtic Christianity doesn't talk about that. It talks about coming into harmony, you know, coming into alignment, coming into completion. In some ways, it's very much like the sacred marriage. Uh, the, the, uh, I think about this image as um, a crossroads or maybe the straight image as perfection 
and the circle as completion. And you can't have completion, um, and you can never have complete completion, you can never have complete perfection. Because if you have perfection, then you're not complete. And if you have completion, you're not perfect. So it's really this um, symbol to remind us that we're less than complete and less than perfect, but that we're the harmony of, or we're the balance or the bringing together of the two. So it's um, Celtic Christianity is a life-affirming uh, way of looking at life, and I think of Roman Christianity as a focus on suffering and death. While you're on Iona, it's a place that's a, a thin place, meaning that it's a place where you can walk between the worlds. Um, and perhaps that's really what, what you meant, that the, uh, the, the Celtic cross reminds you of being able to walk between the worlds. Um, it reminds you of death and rebirth, whereas the Christian cross is really focused on death. Um, the Celtic cross reminds you about seeing into the unseen realms and the fact that mystery is around us all of the time. While you're on Iona, if you stay there long enough, you can start to see the little people. So you can see between the veils. Um, and I think most people that go there do. And if you go there, you're changed forever. And there's lots of places on the earth where you can see between the realms but you have to be open to being seen between the realms. <laughs> I think that Iona became, Iona was really the seat of civilization during around the seventh century because, uh, because of Celtic Christianity. All of the teachers went out from Iona to teach throughout the world and that, that's what they were teaching at the time, but the Romans didn't like that because it wasn't politically what they wanted. They still wanted a very hierarchical culture. So Celtic Christianity was destroyed by the, um, um, I want to say the Visigoths, I don't know whether that's true, but it was certainly by um, warring Vikings in the seventh century. The birth of the divine child is really the birth of self. Um, and I don't mean the inner child that everyone's working with in the um, alcoholic um, work. It's really um, it's, it's becoming aware of spirit, becoming aware of your own soul, and doing the work that you need to do to nurture that, whatever that is, you know, whether it is taking time in nature or um, spending time dialoguing with spirit. It's, it's, it's an evolutionary process. Um, I think we are aware of it a lot in dreams. Um, I'm aware of it in my work with people when people start to have dreams about giving birth. Um, to me, that's giving birth to their own divine child or their creative s self. It's coming into contact with the source, the source of their being. I think the divine child is born out of the descent. Um, I see the divine child as coming out of that darkness of really, I don't see it as much coming out from here, I see it coming from here, coming from the womb and um, uh, having been incubated for however long, nine months, 12 months, nine years, um, it's like, you know, the, the pearl in the shell with the sand, you know, just being um, constantly rubbed against and rubbed against and creating a space for that birth. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't create the space for the birth. That's why staying in the darkness is so important. You know, um, we can't, the light doesn't come forth from light. The light has to come forth from darkness. I mean, black contains all of the colors in the spectrum. Um, it's, we need to spend time in the dark for the divine child to come forward. Yes, it is our creativity. It's our spirit. This is a, a poem by uh, May Sarton, or part of a poem by May Sarton, in which she honors Kali. She says, Kali be with us. Violence, destruction, receive our homage. Help us bring darkness into the light. To lift out the pain, the anger, where it can be seen for what it is. The balance wheel for our vulnerable, aching love. Put the wild hunger where it belongs within the act of creation. That's the birth of the divine child. 
crude power that forges a balance between hate and love. Help us to be always hopeful, gardeners of the Spirit. Who knows that without darkness nothing comes to birth, as without light nothing flowers. Bear the roots in mind, you, the dark one, Kali, awesome power. So the Divine Child does come out of that dark, awesome power. And the Divine Child is us, if we allow ourselves to incubate. And really what I mean by that is if we allow ourselves to, to hold the paradox of not knowing. And that's what we're all doing right now in this culture. Those of us who are doing this work is holding the paradox of being in a very strange place in, in time, of allowing something to be birthed through us that we don't know what it is, but we know that it is the, the feminine and that we know that it's her time and that we know that without her we'll all perish. Again, like Erish Kegel, um, fixing us with the eye of death, Kali grinds us up um, and lets us know that we're not who we thought we were. I mean, that's the power of the Kali. Um, for a lot of women, they have to get in touch with the rage of Kali to get beyond patriarchal mind. And it takes that. It takes rage. It takes um, um, moving into a, a type of warrioress that says, I'm going to start speaking my truth, thank you. You know, your truth doesn't work for me anymore. And you might not like what comes out of my throat. You might not like my words. They may not be pretty. They may not be the nice girl words that I was taught. But for me to touch into my power, I need to find my truth. That's what Kali teaches us. She dances on the dead. <laughs> and the dead is really that part of ourself, that nice girl part, that doesn't get us very far. That goes along with, with Kali, you know, taking, taking back women's rage, taking back women's sensuality, taking back women's sexuality, taking back some of the not nice, um, raucous laughter that women can get into. Um, taking back our own strut <laughs> for ourselves. Um, Taking back the dark means taking back all of those unacceptable thoughts, all of those unacceptable words, all of those unacceptable feelings. Um, it's blurting the truth instead of, oh, should I say that now? Will I hurt their feelings? Um, will it be taken the wrong way? You know, it's having the courage to stand behind your words and having the courage to um, believe yourself. So I think taking back the dark is taking back your own truth. It's, it's really finding your authentic, authentic voice. What's, what's authentic for you? You know, every single one of us knows what's authentic. Somebody will say something to us and we'll think, that's not right, but we might go along with it. So it's saying, no, you know, what's authentic for me? That's not authentic. And saying to the other person, well, that, that might be right for you, but it's not right for me. This is what's right for me. This is what's my truth. This is what is important to me to do right now, or to be right now. So taking back the dark. Taking back the dark is also really taking back the parts of ourselves that we don't like, that we project onto other people. Um, I didn't like my mother's anger, but I carry it. So it's uh, owning my own anger and owning it in a way that can cut through instead of explode onto other people. Uh, so it's using it as a, um, a knife of discrimination instead of splattering people with anger. Um, so taking back the dark is taking back the, the, the disgusting parts, the disappeared parts, the disowned parts. It's taking back all of the parts of myself and reconfiguring them. Well, there's something about rage that um, another way of framing it is to call it creative aggression. Um, when you think about woman's power, if we start to think about women's power as using creative aggression to get done what we need to get done, not only for ourselves, but for the good of others, 
then it's taking that power and using it for a purpose, for a purpose for others, not just to have power. And I think that's the difference between male power or masculine power and feminine power. That masculine power is very much about, I'm powerful, and that's my ego definition, that I'm powerful. I think that feminine power is very much about getting things done for other people. So it's more inclusive. It's not a hierarchical type of power. And I'm not saying that just women have feminine power and men have masculine power, because I know a lot of men who have very feminine power and work for the good of others. And I know a lot of women who have very masculine power who like to see their names up in lights. Um, and they like to have the the title or the money or the status that goes with having, quote, power, but they're really not in it for the good of everyone else. So the difference is, is the inclusiveness instead of the exclusivity. Many of us father's daughters carry a perfect father in our head. And um, that, that perfect father in our head is always telling us what to do and how to do it and well you didn't do it exactly right you could do it a little bit better and if you did it this way then you'd get more recognition if you did it that way then you'd get more money and um, so that perfect father in our head maybe when I was talking before about the wounded masculine in the heroine's journey to me that's what that is is the the wounded father that I carry the wounded masculine. For me, it's my driver that never gives me any rest. But I think as we um, mature, the perfect father in our head loses some of his um, power. Uh, and he doesn't rule anymore. He's not the ruling king principle. Um, I think we come more into dialogue with him and can begin to say, you know, I don't want to do it perfectly. That just doesn't feel right. That doesn't work for my body. It doesn't work for my psyche. It doesn't work for my stamina. Because the, the perfect father within one's head is an archetype. It doesn't have any consideration for the human being, the human woman. And so we have to teach the perfect father within our head who we really are and say no to him. Um, I think we haven't learned how to say no to the Father, um, and that that's a, that's, that's a soul, that's soul work, saying no to that inner perfectionist. Um, we have to remind the perfect Father within our head that he has to eat and drink and eliminate and have sex and go for a walk just the way we do, um, so that he doesn't just have this autonomous life. Um, when we can start to, that's really a complex, you know, something like that is a complex that has an autonomous life. So you have to work with that very consciously and tell it it's not king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fathers, daughters have to do that. <laughs>